So dear committee on peace members, dear participants, dear friends of peace, peace activists and all uh, our friends from near and from far. I could see also one friend from Philippines. She could make it. So thank you very much. And thank you that you take that you make free. You took time from your busy activities. I hope you are fine. And um, we are all uh, working very much for peace and for understanding between people. Our committee is working on two points. First of all is uh, peace education. And um, in the schools, in the family, last meeting we had in April 28th with Mr. Jedlička, who was teaching us or explaining to us how much peace education in the families is important for the future of the... People, when they go to the society, we do uh, analytical lectures about possibilities, how do we can make peace and reconciliation. And um, this is our second point, uh, this armament. Uh, this, in this way, we participated on non-proliferation treaty meetings where we support our governments or all governments to stop the weapon production and also business with weapon, with all kinds of weapon. In 21st century, century, we are ready to cooperate and to work together and create a like win-win situation, well-being for all people. Uh, today we are we concentrate our Zoom webinar, our discussion about some practical example of cooperation in the areas where long time people were confronted with. Oop. Oh. Hmm. Maria, you're you're muted. Uh -huh. Sorry, we try to get her back. Maria, can so Mikrofon einschalten. Ja. Uh, you're you're muted, Maria. So now, can you hear me now? Yes. So, uh, yeah. So today we have topic. Hmm. Mrs. Caroline Hanschin is lives in Lausanne, Switzerland, near Geneva, where she works for where, where in Geneva at the United Nations. She works uh, for three decades as a representative of Women's Federation for World Peace International. Today she is chair of Committee on Status of Women in Geneva, uniting many NGOs women's NGOs worldwide. And she works also in many other different committees at the United Nations, as Committee on Right and Development and Committee on Interreligious Dialogue mm -hmm. as a way for peace and understanding mm -hmm. between people from different backgrounds. 
Today, she will introduce to us several practical projects to create spaces for understanding and cooperation between people, communities, and nations to overcome long time enmity and fighting and to create areas for cooperation and well being for all. This in she and her team supports in this way the SDGs and also United Nations work worldwide from the civil society level. So with the floor is yours, dear Caroline. We are happy that you could make time for us and you can introduce some project. Yes. Of course, originally maybe, yeah. Thank you very, very much. So floor is yours. Thank you. The screen is mine, this in fact. <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank, thank you so much for the uh, the invitation. I'm actually honored because I have heard for some decades about the Committee on Peace from colleagues in Geneva when we were, I was working, we also used to have a subcommittee within the NGO CSW some time ago on d disarmament, and I was involved there. And um, and of course, from Maria over the years also, I sort of could follow some of the, the important work that you're doing. Um, I will share my screen and um, there we go. And then I will try to, uh, No, sorry. As I was explaining before, before we opened up the, uh, ah, why is that? Oh, I know why actually. Um, oh, sorry. Because I am, that's what you get when you decide you're gonna try a new kind of um, platform. This was recommended to me by my brilliant assistant, young 23-year-old assistant. And um, and why is that not opening? Oh, sorry. Can You can see it though, right? Can you yes. see that? Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Well, I know what I will do. Wait a minute. I will change, check it there, enter full screen. Okay, now that, is that better? So yeah. uh, I will- It's Caroline. Okay, thank you. Um, I will speak today from the perspective of my NGO, but uh, of course, always bearing in mind that anything we're doing, we are so interconnected. Of course, part of the, the committee, I'm part of the family, I'm part of a, you know, so many different kind of, uh, teams and groups, and as all of us are, and ideas being shared around. But I have just decided to select, actually it's four uh, good practice programs of the Women's Federation uh, with basically three categories, three categories because there are two of them under the uh, category of youth. So uh, First, just to make the point, which I think is, is the whole idea of this meeting today is we cannot just always continue the way we have been doing things over time. You know, we have to be open to new ideas. We have to bring in new partners. I would say working with young people is one of the most exciting stimulations to in innovation that I know of. And as being a mother of a large family, I. I see exactly the same thing in my family. And um, of course, there are these elements of technology and social media and bigger audiences and more engagement. These all can make a big difference. Uh, I will just start, basically I will into, introduce these programs, but maybe just to say a little bit where I'm coming from, where we're coming from. So within our programs, uh, the Women's Federation programs, we, we have our vision of peace. 
it's a, it has, it's, of course, it's many faceted, but it always comes back to the point that actually it has to begin to me. I have to also be an embodiment of a peace leader myself in order for all these extensions that I'm a part of, you know, to, to have the greatest chance for success. And that we would say that the, the best paradigm for peace is the idea of a global family. This is not just our idea. We can find it at the UN, you know, major documents. You can find them in, in religions. And uh, in this uh, paradigm or in this vision for peace, of course, we understand and we promote very much that women's role is of great, great importance as co-leader, as she is a co-leader in the family. And that elements which uh, we don't always talk about at the UN, I know, um, like love, but I think no one can deny that, you know, the capacity to love and to draw out goodness in others is an essential, really, truly essential element in creating a culture of peace, global peace. So the way we work, we have very broad partnership. I mean, as many NGOs do, we work among NGOs, we work among like-minded NGOs, women, but also many different kinds, you know, education or focused on different SDGs. But what we do is we, and very much in partnership and more and more, we're very involved with young people actually, bringing in young people in all different ways. We have many internship programs myself. I am running those programs in Geneva at the UN for what, six, 17 years now, I think, but we're constantly remodeling them according to the new people that come in and according to the brilliance of the young assistants that I have too, who come in with their good ideas. And um, um, so what we do is we, we, and that's what I will be telling you about in these programs is that we provide a sign of a, a place for this creativity and innovation to flourish by bringing people together who love peace, who are connected at different places in the global system from UN to local, to religion, to, you know, all different areas. And we can find every time coming up with new ideas and then we practice them together. But always these ideas, and maybe one of the great success, reasons for success for some of these is because it's coming from real local needs because of our connection to the local. We are an NGO that began locally. We had a uh, hundred and, you know, we actually 120, 100 and, almost 150 nations we had chapters in. I think now we're down to 130 for different reasons, including conflict. And um, so this process of no, staying in touch with what's going on locally, and then trying to bring that into the, you know, the different systems of governance that we are working with, like at the UN in Vienna or Geneva or you, or even the local governments. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So I will give a little bit of detail then to these different programs. Um, we have two programs under the category of youth and youth working in peace building. One is the Youth Peace Building Commission uh, program that we set up uh, just uh, three years ago in Geneva through our UN office and working with my assistant, Shruti Lekka, this young 23 year old who has many, many bright ideas. And then the other is a, a, a older one. It's, it's our Interfaith Youth Council, which was founded in 2008 together with other NGOs. Actually, in, I would say the exciting point of this was that it actually came about because of a friendship that we had with Ambassador Makarim Wibisono, who was the last Human Rights Commission uh, chair just before it became the Human Rights Council, and of course continued beyond working in the Human Rights Council. He was also ECOSOC president. He has had many different missions, also Ambassador Gary Domingo of the Philippines. So we had these two governments, and then the Women's Federation and Universal Peace Federation. Really, we sat down together and we tried to think how we could 
create a different kind of a platform for interaction and, and problem solving, both of different faiths, but still, you know, like in the in the best sense in terms of religious um, uh, broadness and capacity, we came up with this idea that we wanted to create an interfaith youth council. That was one aspect of the program. And that would be, as you see here in the photo, inviting young people. These are young people from UK, Switzerland, France, um, Africa, one Africa, different. Uh, I think this this was the, the, no, this was not the first one. This was the third meeting that we had. But basically what we would do is whatever the, the current issue that was coming up that time at the UN, either at the Human Rights Council or you know, if the uh, uh, Security Council, we would uh, pick that issue up and we would offer it to the, the group of youth representing their faiths to uh, to think see how they would like to solve that. So it's it's a model UN kind of project, but we just we did it a little bit differently because even when we started reaching out to these young people in in Geneva, we went because we had the idea that we we don't just want to create a nice program for young people, but we actually want to influence those who are already in decision making. So we went to the religious leaders, the heads of the faith communities in Geneva and asked them to send us their best youth delegate to represent their faith. And uh, thereby, of course, all of those religious leaders would come when we would make events. So they would be in the audience listening to their brilliant, bright, good uh, young leaders from their faith and, and the kind of innovation that they would come up with for how would I you know, how would I uh, solve this? We, of course, we talked about the Middle East. We talked about Southeast Asia. We had one about um, just the whole idea of mediation, how mediation works and, and what are the, the qualifications needed for that. We had one about the family, about intercult uh, multiculturalism and peace. And they, it, it was just fascinating to see. Also, they're all bright. They're all studied. They're all like usually they were university age or some high school students, but but anyway, it was really um, it, it it was really a, a great experience. We haven't done this now for the last two years, but it is not closed, so we hope to continue that. So, what I thought is I will I will um, the actually maybe I have to say yeah. This, you, I will first go into the Youth Peace Building Commission, and um, I have a, a um, short video. The first Youth Peace Building Commission, uh, uh, Youth Peace Conference, which was basically a simulation of a youth UN Peace Building Commission with the goal to write up a peace accord was, as it says at the bottom, was in 2021, and we started out with Israel and Palestine. And that was quite an amazing experience, in fact, because we had young people from Israel and Palestine, but also, and they were defending their own countries, which is not always the case in the model UN programs, but we, we thought to get the real passion to see if it would really be possible to work something out between young people of Palestine and of Israel, if they could do better than their seniors seemed to be able to do. And they did come to some accord and they had some special arrangement about territory and Jerusalem. And anyway, you can find this on our website. In fact, it's very amazing reading. But anyway, I go to the one that is the more recent one. And that was uh, the second the second U.S. Peace Building Commission simulation was to write up a peace accord for the, the situation on the Korean Peninsula. So. I will show you this less than two minute video that my young assistant put together.
So <laughs> that is another sort of another example of working within partnerships because she and I have different views about how we would make little videos like that. But I, I learn over and over again by listening and just trying to put myself in the view, you know, from the perspective of the other, the partner, the collaborator, that I learn very much. So um, anyway, I, I asked beyond the video, I wanted that you could see maybe a little bit more clearly some of what came out of this video, because the idea was come was to reach a peace accord. Now we had more trouble in this um, event with North and South Korea. We had, of course, South Koreans who were willing to uh, to to speak. North Koreans. We had North Korean participating, but they could not speak. Um, they couldn't speak on the screen because of the political situation there. So we had to have we had someone from Pakistan, a young uh, university student or master student who represented uh, North Korea, who did a, phenom a phenomenal job of behaving what I would have thought a North Korean, how they might behave if given this, this opportunity to sit down with, uh, you know, a young, young, young uh, South Koreans. And of course, the rest of the delegation, you saw the picture, they were young people from all over the, I think all five, both times we did this from all, all regions of the world, we had we selected, uh, you know, like 15, 20 youth who would be part of the delegation, and then others were observers. <clears throat> so as you can see, of course, they brought in their ideas. You know, we, I was there, a few of us were there, Zoe, a few others were there. Uh, also, you even saw Maria there. Maria looked very worried, actually, like maybe peace wasn't possible, but of course we know she, she doesn't think like that, right, Maria? And... Um, so anyway, we actually worked out all these things, or these young people did, and we were there maybe only like we we, we represented the, uh, uh, I think I represented, one time I represented UN Women, one time special uh, special rapporteur on Korea, on the Koreas. We, we created like uh, titles for ourselves so we could be there on the screen more as observers, but just in case something came up, we could also intervene, but it was really, it was really their process. And it was, you know, as you can see, it was quite remarkable. Uh, that's all. Oh, the, yeah, there were two of them. So there's this one, one, the, the kind of the preambles, and then really working out the different articles where they involved, they, they also asked for youth to be involved importance of education in raising awareness of unification, especially for the youth through global citizenship education. So they had really, they thought very seriously and uh, wisely with the, you know, also youthfully. Um, and, and of course, the, what the, um, uh, our, our part as Women's Federation also because of our consultative relations, we like to take these things a step further, not only hold them in the United Nations or invite UN or government officials to participate, but then when this document was prepared, finalized, then we sent it on to the Peace Building Commission in New York, not knowing what they might do with it, but also hopefully thinking, you never know, it can, it can possibly influence things. So, would would there be any questions? Would anyone like to say anything at this point before I go, go into the second uh, the second program? I can't really see if anybody's hand is up. Maybe you can even just speak out if you want to say if you'd like to say something or add something. No. Okay. So I will go on then to the second the second program, and that is the idea of from zones of conflict to creating peace, creating a place where peace could develop and, and be born actually, which is again, some kind of a, you know, connection to mother, to women, to, and I, I, that is the kind of thinking that we have also, also in the Women's Federation. And this is a program, Women, Peace and the Environment Project at the DMZ. Uh, Women's Federation, of course, our home base is, uh, we, were, we were born in South Korea in 1992. 
And um, so since almost the beginning of the Women's Federation, we have, there is, of course, a concern of the Women's Federation in South Korea for, you know, supporting the North and supporting the people with humanitarian programs. So we, uh, there was an ongoing program over, over since then. Whenever it was the borders were at all open, there were things going on between the, the, the South towards the North. And um, you can see these are real situations of meeting with them. This uh, on the right there was our earlier Women's Federation president and they planted trees, they, they painted, uh, they, they sent some special kind of paint, non-leaded paint that could be used to paint schools and homes and things. There are a whole series of creative ideas. And um, in the year, um, yeah, in the year, well, this is 2019, but it was actually 2017, um, based upon actually the idea of the founder of the, the Women's Federation of using these this area, actually in a speech that was made at the UN in New York in the year 2000, the idea to use the areas between zones of conflict to try to be, begin to germinate some seeds of peace that could then hopefully affect the conflict on e either side of it. So we picked up this idea and uh, in Geneva, especially, we, we held a series with some partners, we held a series of Human Rights Council um, um, uh, side events. And um, with this theme, something changed a little bit each time, but Korea, women, South and North, peace, family strength, rights and development. Sometimes it was peace, rights and development. And as you can see, we did it in the 34th, 38th, 39th, 41st and 42nd. So we really, we, we realized it was an idea. And the idea, anyway, maybe I should tell you what the idea is. The idea is um, to, in this place, in the, what is the demilitarized zone, the, to create a place where women from North and South could meet and begin to work together in some very small way, but to have some kind of communication and to work on, you know, of course we can't work on human rights issues. We can work on development. We can do small business. We can just stimulate each other in small ways. And that this should then go on, go on to, um, uh, you know, maybe in the future, a little bit further down the line, women from around the world could be able to join this. So these were the earliest ideas. And we found, we, we discovered, as you see the speakers in this, just one of these sessions, I had a, especially a partner, Women's uh, UN Research ne Network. Uh, Lois Herman was, uh, we were the two for initiators of this. And uh, one of the first people that I reached out to was because the governments were not so easy to talk to about this, you know, giving us, this land to put some some place, no matter how nice of an idea it sounded, um, was to to talk to the special rapporteur on the North Korea, Mr. Oyea Quintana. And even with him, I could see when I wrote to him, even it takes a little while for good ideas or any idea that's different to settle in. So the first time I found some kind of a polite answer, but then every time we made an event, I would write more and tell him more about it. And he, I felt that he became such a, an adver, advocate for this idea. And several times he sent messages to this. And um, as you can, if you don't mind, I will just read this. I know you can read it too. But uh, part of one of his message was, when I hear that women from the South and their networks globally have been reaching out to women in the North, investing in reconciliation, dialogue, cultural and humanitarian projects that have built bridges of trust, I feel encouraged about the future of the Korean peninsula. And then he went on to say, remember he never could visit North Korea. They would never let him in, of course, because they, I'm sure you know this in Vienna, in your, in your, in your committee, maybe not everyone on the screen does, but of course they don't trust him coming from maybe the human, right, human rights side. Huh? So, so in the way he described this, this place that I had been trying to convince him about was a peace zone, a meeting place for women in or near the demilitarized zone. 
This refuge would be a site where regular sharing between North Korea and South Korean women could, so he basically took what I had written, in fact, in that part, and then added a few points where grassroots leads and resources of local knowledge could be taken into consideration. And then he said, count on me to advocate for this peace building partnership meeting place for women as an original and concrete initiative, which may help erase division and forge a future peace. So, and as you can see from these speakers that we had, we had World Health Organization, we had Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, we had Inclusive Peace and Transition Institute, incredible institute that looks into the statistics of the differences that women leadership makes. And anyway, maybe we had people from South Korea every time, we had people who were leading other NGOs, we had the Carnegie Carnegie, uh, Endowment. I had we had someone from my own my own NGO CSW, uh, graduate women. Um, so, so this was something. Of course, the the uh, um, finally realizing this place is of course not just up to us. All we can do is keep advocating for it, talking about it, creating, making events making our circle wider, bringing in young people, talking to, of course, we're talking to the governments. We always send invitations to North and South Korea, to America, to everyone who, you know, who we felt would be interested in this and hoping that by repeatedly doing this, the ideas could sink in more. And um, so uh, some of this, I, I think I already explained, but uh, you know, this understanding that peace has to come from the bottom up. Of course, we know this. We know that it's not just you can't sign a peace agreement and say, OK, the, the border is here and then people will live in peace. We have to really always go from the bottom up and secure it from the top down, of course. So. Um, yeah, maybe I will, okay, I will go on to the next. This maybe just to say this is. Actually, we, the Women's Federation, we brought one in 2007, I think it was, we brought 660 or 50 or 60 women from around the world. I think maybe even a couple of you on the screen might be here. These, we met in the DMZ. We, we met with North Korean women. These were North Korean women, these three in the front. And this was our Women's Federation president and future Women's Federation president. Even I was there. And uh, in the evening, we heard from them. We heard from the Korean women. It was amazing that they even allowed us to be there and allowed us to meet with the Korean women, of course, whom they designated, the North Korean women, whom they designated, of course, to meet us. And then in the evening in this big auditorium, we had this reconciliation, this first lady, on the right here, she is North Korean, and she was in tears, actually. Huh? She was in tears. I mean, every, many were in tears. It was a very solemn, profound feeling. Of course, we knew, we knew they weren't free, but something, something touched something, and we never know exactly where that could lead. Huh? So from that, um, yeah, it became more exciting, as, as it does when we, we got more partners, then the more we talked about it more broadly, bringing in, again, bringing in young people. And then this partner right here, Border Meetings, this logo. Some of you might have heard her speak. Her name is uh, Anna Grishting. She's from Geneva. She's an urban designer, good friend of mine, became a good friend of mine. And she designs uh, peace memorials and peace zone, not really memorials, no, like peace, sort of like peace zones, actually. She has done something in Cyprus. She's done some things in, uh, was it Saudi Arabia? Someplace in the Middle East, not not Israel, Palestine, but, um, and she has this just brilliant, she's also an environmentalist. And, you know, so when we met her, she brought in this idea of connecting it to the environment. So not just a place to meet where we can work together and flourish and you know, create a greater prosperity through women um, and then convince the higher ups, the governments that actually we can trust each other. But um, then we brought in this element of 
um, seeding the future and this whole whole idea of, of um, making it a peace garden. It would be a place that we would call a women's peace garden, garden at the DMZ. And it would also be used for environmental issues to study that area. Actually, the DMZ area is a place that has been kind of non-touched that during this whole period and uh, 70 plus years. And, and so there are, there are different flora and fauna and, and anyway, many environmentalists are, are quite well, quite aware of that. And the next project we did together on this issue was the Geneva Peace Week. Every year there's a Geneva Peace Week and um, in November, and we did it twice in fact, but this is where we were bringing in other partners. So we had, of course, a panel. We made this long video where we sent all over the world uh, requests for people to send just a couple seconds of their thoughts about this idea of creating a women's peace zone at the DMC. And we received so many from Austria too. We got quite a few, uh, you know, maybe three or four people sent us something. And, and then we went further with some of the young people that were involved with us. They had this idea that let's put a, a wall up during this period. And, you know, everyone, so it would go beyond this first to the fifth of November, but beyond that people can go in and they can put in their ideas of how this peace zone could be. Um, so this is, I think I've, I basically, I've said most of that. This is some of uh, this is one of our programs. They're also working with some children, uh, uh, this young children cultural dance group in South Korea, and e even uh, one point the South Korean the South Korean dance troupe of the young children met with the North Korean dance troupe of young children, and they spent several days together. It was very also a very profound experience, and. Um, um, yeah, and anyway, also within this, of course, within this this little seed of peace at the DMZ that we thought if we start small, maybe we could do something and get something going. But actually, the vision is much bigger than that. The vision is not just a small place. The vision is actually to use this DMZ as a place where even ideally, um, you know, even the United Nations could come in. There could even, even I know some people have taken this idea and run with it and, um, you know, make a peace park. There have been designs, even one of the local governments near the DMZ actually was, just that, that this idea was discussed with them and they even came up with a, a kind of a, um, what, like a design, in fact, for what could possibly be there. There could be a UN headquarters, maybe for the environment or something about women or even interfaith, because so many of the world's faiths come from that region. There is no, you know, there is no major UN office in that whole Asian region. In fact, we we have them all. In fact, it's 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 not fair. So there are many things that could develop, develop but this idea, of course, has to has to run and expand. And then as a final word on this, um, the most recent development with this DMZ uh, space is that we've been working with um, a um, New, York, New York University uh, professor who works a lot with the meta metaverse. She came in about a year, a year ago into this partnership and also the CEO of Girls in Tech whom I met when I was in New York, actually at the Commission on the Status of Women. And so we recently had another meeting and brought in some young people from South Korea who work in girls in tech. And uh, we're, now we're on this, this kind of line. Well, since right now we can't get into North Korea, it's kind of stopped, but we are unstoppable. And I think women work like that because we are really hands-on. We see what a difference this piece could make for people's lives. We see it clearly, it's not just theoretical. So we keep, okay, that idea is not working right now. So let's go on to the next one. And we have this idea, as you can see, this metaverse to create a metaverse where, you know, even beginning, even we can't get the young people from the North yet, we can at least get young concerned people um, or diaspora of North Koreans, you know, to meet together in the metaverse and create this kind of spaces. 
And um, so, the, as we know, the, the sky is the limit, huh? Any, how's everybody doing? Are we okay? You, any questions or? Yes. Yes? Please just speak out if you have a question or, or, or comment. No? Okay, I will go on. Anyway, this is my uh, No Peace Without Women. This is the last kind of project I wanted to talk about. So we, we, our first one was in September, 2000, uh, September 15th, 2022. It was virtually, virtual. And uh, it's an event of the Women's Federation for World Peace Europe, Middle East, and uh, also an organization called the International Association of First Ladies for Peace, which is an association of the Universal Peace Federation. But it brings this idea of bringing in first ladies, which is a unique group of people. There are not so many of them in the world. And um, also they have maybe different, you know, I know there are first ladies who don't necessarily want to be seen as first ladies because maybe they have their own, you know, they feel they have their own mark to be made. And of course they do. Uh, but there is something about this category of women that uh, are even not women, actually men too, who can be spouses of, of uh, leaders, national government leaders. Um, there's some element of this, you know, non-political position of feeling responsibility for a nation of people and the perspective that you might have on how you can help. And if we look, which we have done, if you, if you look at even the biographies of different first ladies or wives of, you know, uh, male spouses of, of, um, of uh, wives of leaders of countries or um, even any, you know, spouse of a leader of a country. And they, they're all active. They all, they're almost all, they create their own NGOs or they're active in many different humanitarian ways. And they come go about it with a different kind of, I would say style or a different kind of motivation, almost more, in the best case, more selfless, I would say, as might be the case of a mother in a family where you your whole concern is for your family. You're not actually so much concerned. You're not as much concerned about you. what is the benefit to yourself. And of course, this is a very good quality of giving if we can do that. So anyway, the first event was... Um, I just want to see something. I think the order changed here. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so the, the No Peace Without Women series, uh, this is Kosovo, this picture. That's me at the podium. Just happened a few, a week ago, or no, a little bit more than a week ago. And the idea was uh, it grew out of this team that we had, an advisory team back in, you know, 2021, some women's federation leaders in Europe. We had some UN leaders. We had Mrs. Algayarova, who actually maybe you remember from Vienna. She was an ambassador in Vienna. And, um, but she was also currently head of the UNECE in Geneva. And um, also several first ladies from Lebanon and, and other advice from other first ladies in Europe and Middle East. And then uh, we had a former prime minister of Finland, former deputy prime minister of uh, Albania, and of course, this small group of NGOs. And this was the team that sat together and we called a meeting. I was at the UN and we had a, a, a meeting. We also uh, on virtually um, that uh, it was right after the, um, uh, the Ukraine war broke out and uh, we were all sort of still in shock. I think we were all still in shock, actually, by the fact that this could happen yeah. again in our country, in our in our region. When all of us thought after Bosnia, after Kosovo, surely not another war. We cannot let this happen again. Like we all said after Rwanda, we said the same thing. But OK, who's going to be the one to realize that? The governments to make no more war? So we felt, in that moment, we felt so strongly, we had this meeting and we decided women have to do something about that. It can be decided, no more war. Of course, it, 
you can't just decide it in your corner and you have to kind of win everyone else in the world to the idea. But if we don't try, it's really, you know, it is really very, very sad if we don't try, especially when we feel so outraged and so passionate about it. So we felt we have to try and we decided to create this series and ultimately even a campaign called No Peace Without Women. And um, so we had this first event and it was, a little, a little, it, anyway, I'll show you the invitation. And um, yeah, this was the first one. I'm sorry, my picture is there. I just happened to be the, the, uh, the one that introduced the, the session. But I mean, what are women bringing to peace processes, conflict prevention and human security? But with the goal that it, we are not just having another discussion. We want to really get closer and closer to this point where we can say, okay, we're making this network. We're making this, this campaign to really demand no more war. We have to solve our differences in different ways. And even as we all have the experience in our families, and even sometimes if we're lucky in our communities or different associations, we can solve our problems in different ways. We don't have to have a fist fight when we disagree with each other. So we sort of still have that determination. And we had here, as you can see, Mrs. Uh, First Lady of Lebanon, who definitely had her experience with, uh, with war and conflict, an amazing person. We had the Director of UN Women in Geneva. We had, oh, by the way, we had also our partnerships are getting broader. We had the Mrs. Mawawad's Foundation, UN Women, NGO CSW Geneva, Seroptimist International. So we're, we're really expanding. And um, we had uh, Afghan, uh, very famous, amazing leader in Afghan who is running uh, um, educational programs for young women and girls. And uh, Ingeborg Brindis, a long friend of mine from the past, who was the head of the Women and Culture of Peace program of UNESCO, which was really in the year 2000 and before, you know, it was the Culture of Peace program that she was working. She was she was working. She was the core team of the Culture of Peace program, and uh, deputy deputy chief uh, peace building fund. I mean, we found just an incredible network of people from all levels. European Parliament. Um, we have we found a advisory mission to the Ukraine from Finland. Someone to come and speak about that. And it was just because of the nature of the motivation of this event. If you, anyway, maybe we can send this around to you, this link. You can listen to some of these, uh, what some of these women speakers said, because it was very, very, very profound, actually. Huh? Former president of Serbia, even, you can see in the third session. Huh? Uh, so this is what we have to do. We have to bring the people of the, especially through women from the, the different conflicts together and listen to each other, realize we're experiencing similar things, realize you know, determine that we're not going to continue this anymore. So I'm almost finished. And just uh, just maybe this is the last thing. It just happened a few weeks ago. Uh, and this was our event in Kosovo. And this was an invitation that we received based upon um, being together at a, actually it was at a UPF event in Korea, a summit. There were many leaders from Kosovo, uh, sorry, from the Balkans. And uh, actually, the wives were invited too. So if this time, many, many came. And in this case, also, it's pretty much all male heads of state. But uh, during the time we were together with them in Korea, we could, um, you know, we could meet some amazing women and men, actually. And even to, at one point, we even asked them in one plenary what they think, the men leaders asked them what they think, uh, what kind of difference what kind of different developments could have happened actually if women had been, or if more women had been leaders in their countries. And we got a few answers from, <laughs> from those men. And, um, but anyway, so, but the idea was, of course, we all know in Kosovo, again, uh, things are, there's some unrest and, um, and we, we know that all things have not been reconciled. And we, I think, especially as women, we understand the importance of reconciliation. We understand, I mean, again, not to be too simple about it, but it is profound also. If we look, 
we know very well in our close surroundings or in our families or even between our husbands and wives, when we do not sincerely apologize or show that we have, cha have a change of heart after we have deeply hurt someone, there's something that stays underneath the surface, you know, that can be ignited. And this is what I, this is what happens. And this is what even some of the women leaders who came to this meeting and spoke about, uh, that is what they said. So we had women from all of the Balkan countries. We had women who were um, amazing women leaders, all, I think all who suffered the experience of even some imprisonment, some having been shot, some, uh, you know, or f family members hurt or killed or just communities destroyed. But they all came together, together when we invited them. We were, I don't think we had one, only one, had we invited one leader who couldn't come or didn't want to come. I'm not sure. Even from Serbia, we had someone, and um, which was politically not easy. And... Um, uh, in fact, and that was because they were currently at that time, they were living in another country. But uh, but nevertheless, there is a kind of a will. And what I found was there is a, a refreshing, some kind of, here, here's two of the invitees we had. That is Mrs. Al Al so, so it was all Balkans, almost all Balkans. But we had ambassadors coming from about 12 countries, also quite a few from European countries, the rest Balkans. And then we invited two UN senior women, Olga Algairova, again, whom I think some of you know, head of UNECE, and also uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, who was the former president of Liberia and um, Nobel laureate, but also who worked on vic uh, victims of crimes, you know, rape and and had some intimate connection also with Kosovo during the, the just following the Kosovo war I think so it was an amazing moment actually amazing uh, one day one full day we had three sessions we talked about 1325 we I mean one of the key outcomes was that we would the, the best way to reconcile is to work together to develop programs that are for the betterment of all of our communities. We see each other investing in the others, quote unquote, the enemy's community. And over time, this works things out. This makes a difference. And it was, uh, I, I one, maybe one small thought I would, I would want to pass on was I was, because I have uh, facilitated meetings between Israel and Palestinian women and the intensity of their debate. And having this feeling that you sort of, Maybe you're losing, you're losing control. That you know they're they're getting so infuriated with each other, and there's too much anger and resentment. But uh, anyway, then the women walking out, going to the coffee break, and coming back and starting up round two, like with some kind of a determination that this is too important to 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 not continue. No matter how hard or painful, no matter how much I don't want to listen, I have to stay here and do that. And I think this also is a capacity of women who are, uh, you know, not all women, but who have this real future in mind of what it will be like for their children and families and communities. So, but these women were even, you know, it was not so long ago. Wait a minute, I'll go back there. That's my last slide. These women are, um, they even would stand up there and they would say, you know, I was uh, tortured or raped or my, you know, people in my family were, I was shot. We had, uh, we had one, so we strategically invited women that we of course thought would be good for this kind of event. And uh, from the UK, our Women's Federation president in Europe, she invited the uh, kind of a, a humanitarian aid work worker from the Kosovo time, uh, who had this very heroic reputation of being shot and refusing to leave the place where she was because there were a hundred children who would be left uncared for if she if she left and and you know and imprisoned I think even tortured anyway so we brought her there and it was really such a powerful message because she also didn't accuse those that hurt her but she was totally there for the sake of a of a future peace. So my last slide just kind of thought that at the end. Zoe, if you're still there, I don't know. But uh, this was just something that the women did. This was our, our Middle East Women's Peace Conference. I think the 
the, the, the main chair of that, I think, is on, was on the call, Zoe Bennett. And um, we had, a, there's been a series since 2020. I mean, there have been a series of 24 of them, actually, since, I believe, 1998 or seven. And this one was one, uh, I think it was for just before COVID, I guess. Huh? And we were sitting there, which we usually do. We have lecture, uh, we have uh, sessions during the day talking about, we, we had actually one of these we had in Vienna at the UN. We had three of them in Geneva at the UN. This one was in a hotel in Cyprus or Greece. And, um, and it was at a moment between Israel and Palestine that it was the feeling among the women who lived in Israel and Palestine that peace is possible. But we have to move this, you know, we have to move this heavy global leadership group uh, to let them know to seize this opportunity because the feeling something had changed. So in this meeting, several several meetings late into the night, we wrote a letter to the president of the Security Council, which when I went to New York a month late, a couple months later, see, he has it in his hand with the Women's Federation logo. I brought this letter to him. I had to fight so hard to get this meeting actually because he was in the middle of his sessions. And then finally through his assistant, he came out and he met me and I explained to him about you know, we can't force you to do this. All we can do is plead with you that we have, you know, educated, concerned women working locally in Israel and Palestine who say now is the time to let your guard down a little bit and take a few bolder steps towards peace in the Middle East. And with that, maybe I close my presentation. <laughs> I have no idea how long I spoke. I'm sorry, Maria, if how long it was. Huh? It's very good, Caroline. Thank it you. Was, it was very, very good. Many good examples of practical activities. Thank you. And uh, we need to be encouraged a lot uh, because still we are in the situation very many times when we... Um, the cooperation in more than to subjugate somebody. Yeah, we need to understand each other and listen to each other. And you spoke about these steps. And um, even if we are not successful externally, internally, we don't give up. Mm. So thank you very much uh, from the practical fields and many, many talks behind the scene and behind. <laughs> writing letters like we are doing the same in Committee on Peace. We are writing letters to governments to stop the development of nuclear weapon development and all, all kinds of weapons. And still, uh, <clears throat> we see that situation is very uh, difficult and complicated. So we stay on board and we believe in our hearts and in our families Yes, you mentioned the families. Of course, in families, we also see many different opinions. Mm. Stay together. So, so do you have some question to Mrs. Caroline Hunching? How? Or, or even just maybe quickly someone others, some other ones little best practice maybe that that they're reminded yeah. by this huh? because i'm sorry i took the whole time i actually did that's why i kept asking you to ask me questions so you could stop me and but you didn't so yeah elizabeth nice to see you <laughs> thank you very much yeah. Very, very impressive and and lots, lots of effort and initiative. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm wishing you success. Yeah. Well, we're in it together. You know, I also with the, of course, your NGO is very active with, with yes. our NGO committee in Geneva, too. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. anyone else, anyone from the Peace Committee, Elizabeth, uh, uh, Maria, maybe that? Okay. Are some of your yeah. committee members there? That yes, yes, Alfred Heiligenbrunner, I can see, and no, here, here I am. 
Yes, hey, Professor Maitzen, yeah. They see me. Yeah, okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Just a very, thank you very much for your nice uh, talk and uh, very important, uh, a very special uh, region uh, of our Earth. Uh, fantastic. But now we have another region, which is not uh, just in a very peaceful evolution. Um, you know what I'm uh, aiming at. This is uh, Russia and Ukraine. What is your opinion about that? Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, we have, of course, Women's Federation in, in Ukraine, and we are very active in receiving uh, refugees from Ukraine. Those who want to leave, we'll receive them in, also in our surrounding, um, in the surrounding countries, and uh, even actually even further. And um, we also have a pro program. I mean, it's not, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how, how, active it has been recently but we have a small had a small program related to the um some kind of psychological support a mobile team that had would give psychological support uh to victims and families huh and um but i think that has did, i'm not sure how long that could continue maybe because of the dangers in fact but um it's hard you know in the middle of the war it's hard in the middle of the fighting to, you know, to see what to do from a distance. There's the, the cleaning up after and the reconciliation. And um, yeah, I must mostly, I'm strongly of the opinion that we should make our voices heard that this, that this has to stop this, this even this war has to, you know, there has to be a global kind of will to, to to insist that this this war stop and that uh, and that others don't start like that. Uh, and what do you think? I'm curious your opinion. If I'm allowed to ask my ask a question back to the questioner. Uh, you just muted. Huh? Yeah, I. You're muted, Michael. Huh? Or maybe someone else has a thought about that. It's. A, I mean, it's of course it's the most important question. What could we do? Maybe some steps, yeah. We were thinking a lot about this, yeah, to yeah. became became brothers again. People, uh, civil society, people, they don't want to fight. And we need, uh, even in Slovakia, where many demonstrations for, for end of the war, because children, fathers and mothers, were asking the, the, uh, the country of of white white Rusland vice uh, and um, Ukraine and Russia and even our president to try to invite yeah. people to the place and to stop uh, to stop fighting and ask what is what are the needs of the presidents or what are what are the expectations of presidents how they could imagine to stop this fighting and to come to the to the table, we listen also to pol the political uh, experti experts experts about possibility of neutral countries to invite people to make you, even yeah. Europe like neutral country. So, yeah. Mr. Meitzen, yes, now you can talk, please. Mm. Michael, Professor Meitzen.
Yeah. I mean, I think I think one point uh, also maybe Mr. Alfred, would you have something to say? You're also in the peace committee. Yes. Um, no, thanks. Mm. Okay. Okay, it's it's nice to to put people together to talk um, together like North and South Korea, but um, uh, I'm not sure if there is any um, general recipe to get peace. Um, war can start out of different reasons, and um, mm. as I think you have to treat every reason for its own. Uh, yeah. Um, um, so I have no idea how to achieve peace. It's a good idea to um, to do what you do, uh, Ms. Hanchin. Um, <laughs> yes. Thank you. And, and thanks for your insights. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Definitely, I was just rep representing a broad group. Uh, you know, it's a great teamwork, actually. I, uh, Zoe, you wanted to add something, huh? Yeah, I'm not specialist on the Ukraine-Russia conflict, but from the experience I have in the Middle Eastern conf conflicts, and of course every, every conflict is different, the main uh, point would be a mutual understanding, a recognition of what the other side is going through, is, is feeling, recognition that there is something to improve in both sides. In every conflict, no one is perfect and the other one totally wrong. Both sides have a part of, of fault and a part of right. So I always see this, even, even in personal communications, it's so easy to misunderstand the other person or the other group or any, any other any opponent in a way. Um, this mutual understanding and uh, giving the, the the right that perhaps the other person has some reason to be like this. Mm. I think uh, uh, an understanding like this can be a good step to soothe things and find solutions. Yes. Yeah, that's what I, yes, so Cyprus is the I same enjoy. thing. Yeah. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Yeah. I th of course, media has such a big responsibility too, to be careful not to just completely polarize, like Zoe said, the two sides. So um, making things worse, easily worse. Huh? And of course, the look at, looking at history to see how historically, I think more and more it's being spoken out how even Mr. Putin comes to the point. I mean, many maybe knew this, but not everyone knows this. You know, how he comes to the point where he feels so compelled to do something so so rash and, you know, inhumane and, you know, surely with no good result for himself either, actually. So how to create a global environment so that people and countries don't feel themselves so sort of isolated and pushed into a corner that they make these kind of rash judgments. And uh, any- Thank you, Caroline. Yeah. Any, yeah. Anyone else? I mean, it's maybe- Yeah. So we received lots of impulse and lots of ideas. And we agree, I think all of us agree that we, uh, the civil society and even leaders, I think they also wish to cooperate together more than kill each other in, in extreme, extreme uh, expression. And yeah, Tina Coombs, you have to tell something to us? Mute, unmute yourself. We cannot hear Hello, you. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for um, your deliberations of, and talks about this no peace without women. And if you talk about uh, it's a very kind of um, daring to ask, but 
we have a global women's peace network and um, and uh, there are no women at all in the when we when we see um putin and also zelensky there are no women nearby so how can we what can we do as a global women's peace network to get women involved there on this level we have a global women's peace network if we all get together and um and um find a way i don't know how but with um you are you are very uh, you're much more kind of um able in that area but is it if we all put our effort to it and say it is true there is no peace without women so we need to involve women on that level mm -hmm. we want peace we want peace for both sides and like um, like you said like so you said you know that um uh, on both sides uh, not one is completely right and the other one completely wrong we have to find a way as a global peace women's peace network to find a way to get them to express what is um, going on why are they why are they fighting what what, what do they want um we want um they also want peace and uh yeah i don't know what you think what what do you think can we find a way to on a global level to bring this global women's peace network together on that level to bring them to bring women there as well you never see any women on tv whenever there is a, a report about uh, zelensky or putin you never see any women mm. so how can we make it that um, we can get women involved who are who want peace and women want peace. I think in Ukraine, there are women up there. Huh? You see them sometimes being interviewed in different ministers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've seen them and they're very strong and they're very good. Less so in Mr. Putin's closest cabinet. I don't see so many women, but, but, uh, but on the other hand, we also know women, I mean, women or men, we, we can influence leadership without necessarily being the spokesperson too, you know. But by the way, we did invite Mrs. Zelensky to this No Peace Without Women event, in fact, huh? but we're not surprised when she said she had to decline, in fact. Huh? We went through okay. our Women's Federation Ukraine. And, okay. Yeah. But, um, I mean, mm. it's, of course, it's a big shift, but I mean, I always, I always think of like little... Uh, examples like, um, you know, I mean, very simple, the one of smoking, smoking in public or smoking in airplanes, you know, it was so considered normal in the past, you can't imagine, you used to sit in the plane next to somebody, and the person would be smoking cigarette after cigarette just next to you. And we never thought, well, we can claim that that's not fair to me, actually. So, you know, mm -hmm. doctors had to tell us why it's not good for us. And then everybody got together. And finally, all of a sudden, there's a legislation. You can't hardly find a place to smoke anymore when you're when you want to. Mm -hmm. So I and I, you know, I think you can probably do that on most issues when it's really comes down to understanding why it's not good, even for the for the perpetrator. It's not good for them as well as for the victims, in fact. Huh? So. Yeah. If if you have that kind of mind, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. well, we support you if you do something in that direction, Caroline. We are all with you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do something without you. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we can't do something without each other. Actually, yeah. Yeah. no, that's right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you, M Mrs. Yeah. Norina Chantel. The please. Thank you, Tina. And Mrs. Norina Chantel. Oh, she can't, she has no microphone or? Unmute yourself, please. You, you, you were, you're now muted, but you weren't muted before, I think. Huh? Yeah, no, maybe there's a problem with your, okay. Well, you could write something no. in the chat if you want, huh? if you'd like. Huh? Well, anyway, from my side, thank you for the chance to 
you know, whenever you're invited to, to, to speak, I'm sure you all know, it means you have to prepare. So you have to think about things. Maybe you didn't realize exactly how many things have are being done or have been done actually too. So, and this is really a, this is not the work of any one person or any one group. It is really a much broader effort. So, <clears throat> yeah, maybe we can support uh, this armament department in Vienna mm -hmm. from 30, 31st of July until 11th of August. Uh, many meetings, so even mentally we can support this with our goodwill and our good wishes that we can stop the, the thinking that just with the logic of power we can solve the problem. When yeah. we stay with weapons, yeah. so then it's end of the story. Yeah, when we kill each other, is end of the story. If we talk, so we can find some solutions, and we can understand what what is when when children are biting or fighting. So of course, I jump in the mid, in the middle of them and I ask, what happened? Yeah. What do you need? What yeah. make you angry? So this mentality or this logic of uh, participation and love and uh, desire to uh, stay in the position of parents or somebody higher level of, of uh, uh, to be ready to reconcile to, or do mediation in our uh, world, we call it like mediation, to yeah. understand why uh, aggressor is becoming aggressor. Yeah. And how we should respond like, like attacked people. So how should we respond? How we should um, stop this fighting? Yeah. So for me, it's always like no weapon. In the, when it's fire, I don't, I cannot put more fire. Then I, I need to find different way how to stop fire. I need water and the the escalate. Uh, the escalation yeah of the fighting and this win-win situation for both sides not win lose if we still think like somebody need to lose and to yeah it's not functioning in our days so thank you very much caroline you put you give us many actions and many hope that we still are alive and we still can move our feet our brain our hands so <laughs> maybe Marie, thank you very much. maybe you can send us some because um, I remember when I was more active in the area of disarmament. We in Geneva, we had at the end of the 90s, we had the head of UNIDIR, this United Nations Institute on Disarmament Research, which is still very active. I'm sure you know about. Uh, she was such an amazing person, I think, nuclear physicist, or but she had a style of leadership that when she would Sometimes when she would stand up and speak to all these governments, you know, during this period, especially this period of impasse about the nuclear weapons, and she would stand up and she would make uh, a make story, tell stories from um, what is this? It's this one children's storybook, actually, as some kind of analogy to the importance of disarmament. That of course, when children are fighting. Um, the first thing you do, if one of them has a rock in his hand, first thing you have to do is get that rock out of their hand, you know, before you can imagine sitting down with that, or sitting them down and explaining to them why they have to love each other or take care of each other. Um, and she, it was, it was quite amazing how she, and the, the kind of effect she had on this conference of disarmament where she would often speak in Geneva, of just changing the atmosphere from this very tense atmosphere where you couldn't all hardly think peace to something more open, in fact. So so what I was going to suggest, maybe Maria, because I think many of us are not so up to date with these disarmament issues, huh? Maybe you we can send you can send some information around that we can you can we, we can read up a little bit. Huh? Okay, last year, this is, it will be next, uh, this year, because Austria is responsible, Austrian uh, Department for Foreign Affairs is responsible to invite countries, they didn't ratify the 
The resolution of the United Nations it was made 21st of January 2021, mm. so two years ago. So mm. every year is follow-up conference to yeah. encourage countries. They are investing in development of, of the weapon industry to stop. And this is what we, is maybe I can send you then invitation for some yeah. some to listen and to yeah. understand the topic even today in the in the in at the neighborhood of the united nations outside was also first preparatory meeting um for the for to, how to stop ukraine and russian war how to invite some somebody yeah so we will see how it develops still we are on the in the process to invite or to to prepare something to protect um, civil society against uh, the, the fighting, against the serious yeah. and complicated situation. So mm -hmm. for today, I think time is running and we can, can we, listen can we, to you for a Could we do a screenshot? Can people turn, I mean, those who want to turn on your cameras and just take, it's nice to have yeah. a little memory of who is here and uh, ah, now I see everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I can do that if uh, maybe your your technician would do that too, huh? but. Yeah, Christian, yeah. Okay. Uh, did someone do it? Because mine, Christian, Christian did maybe. He did? Christian, did you do that or? Okay, now I have it. Okay, everyone smile or look serious, you know, about the issue. Okay, good. I have to. I'll send them to you, Maria. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. Nice to meet time. you, Vienna. And Very nice to work together with Vienna. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Until have nice summer and until September. Yeah. yeah thanks. Maybe with Youth thanks. Congress also. Yes. We can meet with the youth in 12th of August is International Day of Youth mm. from the United Nations. So maybe we can also meet. Okay. We will see. It's lots of work. So thank you very okay. much again. And thank you. Until next time. Bye bye. Latest in September. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye bye and thank bye. you. Thank you. Bye, thank you also from the International Council of Women. Thank you very much. All the best.